So hopefully you'll have caught what the agenda and the housekeeping were from the first walkthrough of it, so I don't have to repeat that again. And I've said everything that I had to say about myself. So let's move on to actually discussing like what the HubSpot coding challenge is and what information I can give you today that's going to be useful about it. Um, basically, the HubSpot coding challenge is a coding assessment that we provide, which people complete themselves at home before they come in for a face-to-face -face interview with HubSpot. Um, you'll be talking to a recruiter who will arrange for it to be sent out to you. It'll arrive via email and it has a link that will bring them to a unique web page for your attempt. And this web page will provide some basic outlines about what you should expect from the assessment, including some advice on the kind of knowledge or topics which will be helpful to solve the problem, which we'll dive a little more into as we're going through this session. And it'll provide you with a link that you'll use to kick off the assessment. Uh, once you click on that link, the assessment will begin. The rest of the information about the assessment, which will involve the specifics of the problem you'll be looking to solve, the details of the API you'll be interacting with, and the shape of the data in that problem, will be provided to you at that point. And the timer will start, because it's a, it's a timed assessment that we provide. Um, and at that point, it's over to you, and you're going to be, you're going to be starting to write some code. Um, before I get into that, though, I just wanted to kind of establish, like, not only what is the HubSpot coding challenge, but why do we provide it? Why is this a stage in our hiring process? Um, and there's a couple of reasons behind that that I just think it makes sense to, to point out. The first is, is scale. Scale is a, a big factor that we can't really ignore here. Uh, HubSpot has grown massively over the last number of years, and it hasn't been possible for us to scale every aspect of our business in a way that would require direct human interaction the entire way. Um, this isn't a problem that's unique to us. I think every company eventually starts to hit these kind of issues. And for us to be able to consider all of the really intelligent and uh, interesting and wonderful candidates who we potentially could have work on our team, we need to be able to use technology to streamline some of the process. It also helps us to establish a level of baseline competency before somebody is committed to a full interview. And um, it does this by letting us examine some of the topics that we have, which are, which are good signals for whether or not somebody could be successful at the kind of work that we do at HubSpot. Uh, and I think more importantly than any of that, it provides the candidate, to you in this case, with a chance to get an understanding of the kind of skills that might be needed on a daily basis working here and the kind of problems that you could be solving. So at the time of going to print today, just under 10,000 people have taken um, our assessment at some point, which is, which is pretty fun. And I'll tell you a little bit about the numbers involved in that later on. So kind of in tandem with what is the coding challenge, I want to talk a little bit about what we were trying to avoid when we designed it. Um, and I'm going to start with a truism, one thing that you know we, we generally just accept to be true, which is that assessing somebody's ability to code can be really, really difficult. It's a, it's, it's a problematic thing to be fully objective about or to be able to grade at a given moment in time. And what we wanted to do in the way that we built this assessment is we wanted to avoid questions which were contrived or pedantic or tedious, and that seemed like the kind of questions that seem like they're trying to trick the person they're asking. The kind of questions that don't bear resemblance to the code that people would actually write in real life, and the kind of questions that can be hard to get motivated about or to translate into working code. Uh, we also wanted to avoid questions that would require hyper-specific knowledge or which would cause people to start thinking, oh no, there's this one specific algorithm that I need to find if I'm going to write the right answer to this. Um, we also didn't want to deliver the assessment through an artificial environment. Basically, we wanted to avoid making it that you had to fill it out in an online portal, because that's not where people generally write and test their code in the first place. It's not the kind of environment that I would do my work in or that people learn and do their best work in. So we wanted to make sure that we avoided creating an artificial setup in which people would have to deliver their work. One analogy that I've come to really appreciate for describing the way that we think of our assessment is one that's kind of related to video games, because I play a lot of video games. One engineer doesn't, it seems like, if you look at most of the tropes. And um, one thing that's really interesting in the design of games is that uh, the, the, the way that 
people are blocked in games or the things that they're trying to to get through in them it can be represented as being either like a problem or or like a puzzle and puzzles generally only have one right answer that you land on be that either true specialist knowledge or true experience or true trial and error whereas problems are things that can be approached from a number of different directions can be attacked with a lot of different tools and where there is not necessarily one right way to, to go about getting a solution to it. So from that perspective, we wanted to provide people with problems rather than providing them with puzzles. So coming up with that, what does this coding challenge actually involve if we get down to the, the, the bones of it? Uh, like I said, it's an assessment that's going to feel like a task that you might do on the job here at HubSpot. We think that this is a lot more interesting for, for candidates and it's more indicative of the kind of work that they would do here. Like I said, we wanted to make sure that it's done in a situation that people are familiar with and that people are comfortable with. So we think it should be done in an environment they're familiar with, which is your own computer, your own development environment and a coding language that you are most comfortable with rather than us coercing you into having to do it with a particular coding language or with a particular framework or setup. So what we do is we provide you with an API, an application programming interface that you will use to retrieve some data that has been generated specifically for you and you only. And this data will represent a real world problem that we'll describe to you in some detail when you start the assessment. We'll ask you to take the data, retrieve the data, and modify it then in some way in order to solve the real world problem that we've described. Uh, we'll provide you then with a separate API that you'll use to send us back this modified data. And that will be an attempt at a solution. Um, and this is going to be a rinse and repeat process. It's possible for people to make many requests to try and get their answer back. And we'll try and give an indicator as to what may or may not be wrong about your solution or what may be more correct about it. And um, when you're finished, you've gotten to the end of the, the assessment, we'll prompt you to send your code into us. And you can take time at that point to refactor or comment or enhance your code as you see fit at that point. This is going to be like probably the most useful part of this slide because we're going to talk about what are the actual topics that are going to be useful to solve our assessment or to do well in our assessment. And by proxy, what are the kind of the, the topics that will make it easier for you to appreciate the work that you might do as an engineer if you work on the HubSpot product team? And um, the first and most important thing that you would need to be aware of is uh, the hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP and how to use that to communicate with an API or an application program interface. The reason for this is because we use RESTful APIs over HTTP for many of our web-facing applications as, at HubSpot. These are generally important topics that anyone working in our engineering teams would need to be familiar with and capable of using. So some, uh, th this is going to be essential no, almost no matter what you do at HubSpot. So for that reason, it's a part of our assessment. It's something that we hope people would have the knowledge to be able to use. Some useful specifics within this topic that it's helpful to focus on would be how one would communicate with an API using the HTTP GET or the HTTP POST methods and when you ought to use one over the other how you can construct an HTTP request using headers, query strings, body parameters, all of the various building blocks that are available, uh, how you would interpret HTTP status codes and know what to do with the HTTP response that you get back from our API. So if you're able to do all of those, you'll be able to do the first and last parts of our question because you'll be able to retrieve the data and you'll be able to send us back the data. Part then of retrieving that data is being able to deal with how that data is formatted. And uh, there are many fine data formats out there that are used for serialization of data. Uh, but at HubSpot, we've ended up coalescing on JSON for our RESTful APIs. JSON is the data format that we, that we use in a lot of places. So as a result of that, we've decided to use the JSON data format for all the communication that you'll perform with the API that we provide for this assessment. So some good things for you to be aware of before you take our assessment is, do you know how to turn the JSON that will be provided to you into an object 
or back into JSON when you've got objects of a particular type in your chosen coding language. So um, are there libraries or mechanisms that you'd be able to use to be able to easily achieve that? The third thing then that's of particular interest kind of goes into the middle part of the question, which is, you know, I've, I've made the request to the API, I've gotten the data back and I've turned it into an object model of some sort. Um, and that's the point where you're going to have to transform that data into another chunk of data that will solve for the problem that you've been asked to solve. Uh, and at this point, it's useful to be able to identify which common data structures might be useful for manipulating the data and how you should use those. So arrays and sets and maps, they're specific examples of some common data structures which exist across basically all programming languages. Um, and what's interesting for you to do here is work out, like, depending on the question you're trying to solve, which data structure should you be using to try and solve a particular problem? Let's say that the data set that's being returned to you is the list of attendees at a particular conference. And we wanted to know, uh, say, one of the data points is which company each of these people works at. If we wanted to find the number of unique companies that attended the conference, which data structure might we use to be able to best work that out? Alternatively, the question might be, can you count the number of people from each company who attended the conference? This is going to have the same input data set. It's going to have different output data sets, and it's going to have different data structures that are necessary to solve for the different requirements that are provided there. So knowing which data structures suit which kind of um, problem solving needs is very helpful when you're trying to solve these, uh, our assessment. So this leads me to the kind of the final and fuzziest bit of advice about like what it's helpful to know before taking our assessment. Um, if you're able to apply these techniques to translate something that's described as a real world problem, then I think you'll be able to solve and enjoy our assessment. Like that, that, that question about finding the number of unique companies that attend our conference, how can you turn that into working code? Uh, I often think of engineers as being like advanced translation layers. Our job is taking the real world and the problems that it describes and how they're put into, into grammar and into language and turning those into conditional blocks, variable definitions, and at the end of the day, bytes and machine code. And this assessment in of itself is kind of a microcosm of that perception. Can you take a real world problem that our customers might need solved and go through the work of turning that into code that can be executed and repeated and which will be able to continue working after? So those are the big pieces of advice I would have about what useful topics are to have covered before taking our assessment. So what are the rules of our assessment then? How, like what are the things we hope people would, would follow? The first is that there's a three hour recommended time limit from the time when you click let's get started on our assessment page. We do allow people to continue interacting with our API after that three hours has passed. And we do accept submissions after that three hour time limit has passed. But that's kind of the upper threshold on the time we think it should reasonably take someone to be able to complete it. You're going to have a unique API key provided uh, when you start the assessment, and this will need to be accompanying every request that you make to our service. Uh, this allows you to get the correct problem and the correct data for your assessment, and it means we can verify that your results are correct. It's okay for you to use Stack Overflow. It's okay for you to use other resources online to look up how to do something. Uh, I think my most frequently Googled term over the last five years has been how to use substring functions because I keep forgetting the difference between the signature in Java versus the signature in Python, JavaScript, MySQL, and I find myself messing it up like one in every 10 times. And at this stage, I've just gotten really good at searching for that knowledge when I, when I need it really quickly. So it's okay to work out how to hook the different things up together that you want to, you want to be able to use. It's also okay to use libraries to solve parts of the assessment. Uh, we aren't expecting people to have the time or energy to re-implement things like the HTTP protocol or to write a JSON tokenizer and parse it from scratch. These are things that it's important that you can find the correct tool for them and reuse it. Uh, we believe at HubSpot that you shouldn't reinvent the wheel if there's already a really good way of doing a particular task. We should use that. 
and we should focus our energy instead on solving the more interesting or esoteric problem that's available to us. The final thing that we would flag is that it's not okay to copy code or to phone a friend, um, or in other words, get somebody else to do the work for you. We want to see what your solution looks like, and it's not in anybody's interest to game the system here. It won't be possible to bring a friend into our face-to-face -face interview with you, and it's probably a sign that you won't enjoy our face-to-face -face interviews if solving our coding assessment is something that you're not enjoying. One final caveat we would say is that we ask that people don't share the specific details of the assessment with anyone else, either in person or online after they've taken it. So how are these uh, assessments actually graded then? This is also a pretty simple set of rules. The first is whether or not somebody finishes within the three hour time limit. The second thing that we look at is how long passed between when they first started the assessment and when we retrieve your first correct submission. So somebody who finishes it in one hour, that will have a slightly higher weight than somebody who took two and a half hours or two hours. But the weighting is still pretty low after somebody has actually finished it. Um, the next thing we look at is the quality of the code. We like it when the code is simple and clear and easy to read. And we very much recommend that people get a working solution in place rather than trying to write perfect code off the bat. We think that there's always time for people to clean up their code afterwards. So you should try to prioritize being pragmatic and iterative and get something that works first. So uh, the last thing that we're gonna move on to is just a couple of questions that were asked ahead of time, uh, which I was able to, to put some answers together for that may be like common worries that people had had before taking the assessment. Uh, the first is like, what kind of programming language are we going to use? What language is most used or recommended? So we believe that somebody should be allowed to use any programming language that they want. Uh, the onus is not on us to tell you what you should or shouldn't code with. We want people to be able to use the environment and language that they're most familiar with. I can tell you that Python and JavaScript and Java are all pretty popular. We get a lot of uh, submissions from people using those. This is probably indicative of their relative popularity worldwide. I will also say that people have provided working solutions using Rust, Kotlin, R, Perl, PowerShell, and Bash at various points. I would recommend that you use a programming language which allows you to easily do the things which I described earlier, communicating over HTTP, using JSON to serialize and deserialize objects. You'll have an easier time solving our assessment if you use languages that are um, able to do that easily. Next question is, how could we prepare for this online coding challenge? And what can we look over our study to prepare for the internship? Like I said, I would recommend that uh, being able to use HTTP, communicate with APIs, use the JSON data format, and have a good working knowledge of how to do the basic data structures in the language that you choose to do the assessment in. That will cover most of the ground in terms of having you prepared to be able to solve the problem that's available. Once people get accepted for internships, cooperative placements, or grad entry roles here, we generally do send them some follow-up information about some of the other technology stack at HubSpot, things like the Drop Wizard um, interface, which we use to build RESTful APIs, uh, the different data stores that we use, like MySQL, HBase, and Elasticsearch, and things like gRPC, which we use for lightning fast internal service to service calls. Um, there's a lot of technology at HubSpot. There's more than I can ever claim to know all about. So uh, at that point, your, your hiring manager or your incoming tech lead will provide you with more information on that. The next question is, will somebody have access to the API documentation before they participate in the challenge? I have to say, no, we do not provide that documentation ahead of time. But we do think that having the knowledge of how to make these HTTP requests and parse data using the JSON data format means that you'll be well able for the format that we provide. The interesting thing that's going to happen at that point is the problem and the problem and how it's described. So that's something that we hold back until somebody starts the assessment. The next question is, have we ever moved forward with somebody who couldn't submit a correct solution? but who had good logic in their code, seemed to have understood the problem. And I would say, yes, there are cases where we've moved forward. The time limit that we provide 
has a somewhat arbitrary uh, capacity to it. And we take into account a lot of factors um, for people's solutions, uh, depending on certain contexts. So it's not always the case where you have to have completed it in order to be considered for a position, but it is a very good, helpful indicator to have been able to complete the assessment in order for us to be confident and for you to be confident that a face-to-face -face interview is going to be something that will go well. And the final question is whether or not the assessment is reflective of the questions that will happen during the on-site. And I would say to some degree, yes, our interviewers will usually describe a real life scenario for you and ask how you would solve it using code or software architecture or uh, how you may design something to work a certain way. Our questions are rarely about, like I said, something that's trying to trick you or something that's trying to be tedious or require specialist knowledge to solve. We generally want to see if you can work with real world problems and use technology to solve them. So those are the questions that we had prepared at our time. And I just want to leave you with some notes on our campus recruitment. Uh, our applications are going to be opening for both our Cambridge and Dublin office for the spring co-op and summer internship roles. Uh, entry level roles are actually now open for the Cambridge office. So depending on where you are located in the world, there are some people you can reach out to with any recruitment specific questions that you have. Uh, in Dublin, you can contact Steph. In uh, Cambridge or in the United States, you can contact uh, Bridget Lamont. And for any of our entry level roles, you can contact Sarah Magner. Um, there are a number of recruitment based questions submitted that I won't be going through because I don't have the specialist knowledge to do that. Uh, and I know that the campus team will be more than happy to have those questions sent directly to them. So that's why I'm providing their uh, contact details there. So that's everything that we had to talk about today from the perspective of the uh, HubSpot Coding Challenge. So thank you all very much for listening to me ramble for the last 20, 25 minutes. And I, I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs>